I very warmly welcome you all to our panel on Sociology of Freedom. Um, this book is written by Abdullah Öcalan. Today we will have an input by Nazan Üstündak and also have the possibility to discuss about it together. This um, panel is part of a webinar series which focuses on the paradigm of I very warmly welcome um, you all to Abdullah our panel Öcalan. on Sociology of Freedom. Um, this book is written by Abdullah Öcalan. Today, we will have... <laughs> um, Erdogan is now in prison since more than 22 years and is spending this time mainly in solidarity in solidarity confinement. Nevertheless, he was able to formulate important ideas and proposals for a free society and a free life for everyone in society. Despite, despite all um, these isolation measures, Abdullah Öcalan's ideas continue to break the boundaries of his physical conditions. And today we will focus on the third book of his present writings, Sociology of Freedom, and will therefore also focus on power and freedom and how these um, are connected um, together. Nazan Üstüna will give us an input on this topic and after we can also have a discussion together. Nazan Ustuna received her PhD in 2005 from the Sociology Department at Indiana University Bloomington. And between 2005 and 2018, she also worked as an assistant professor at Boyazice University at the Department of Sociology. Currently, she is an academic in exile and um, also um, um, part of the Scholar Rescue um, Fund at the um, Forum of Transregional Studies. Nazan also wrote on social policy, gendered subjectivities and state violence in Kurdistan. And she's also a member of Women for Peace and Academics for Peace. So I very warmly welcome you all. And there's not much left for me to say. So I welcome Nazan and her input. Thank you so much for your introduction. Um, so today I will be talking about this book, uh, Sociology of Freedom, written by Abdullah Öcalan. Uh, but it's a really, uh, as you can see, it's a long book, has many different topics. Uh, so I will concentrate on only two topics in this book and not the rest of it. If you want to hear more, uh, if you want to learn more, you should uh, read the book because, as I said, it's a book full of different ideas, full of methodological clarifications and definitions. And it's a must read, in my opinion, if you want to understand Abdullah Öcalan or the Kurdish freedom movement, but also the society that we are living today and how it can be transformed into a free society, into a society where we can pursue our freedoms. So the top two topics that I will be concentrating on is, are going to be power and freedom. Uh, and uh, Abdullah Öcalan has written extensively on these two topics. Actually, his whole endeavor, his whole life is dedicated to a search for freedom and how to overcome hierarchy and power uh, as they manifest themselves in contemporary society, which has been uh, come into a be being uh, 5,000 years ago. Um, so uh, the, the first question that I will uh, dwell in, and I will try to make this as short as possible to tell you the truth, because I really like a discussion and debate, and I believe uh, the more question, the, the more time there are for questions, the more fruitful the discussion will be. So I will try to uh, keep it short. So the first question that I, uh, Abdullah Öcalan is interested in this book is how can we understand power, and how does power operate in contemporary society, which he calls capitalist modernity, uh, capitalist modern, yeah, which he calls capitalist modernity. The second question is, how can we transform capitalist modernity? How can we get rid of capitalist modernity? How can we, uh, we uh, build a democratic society? 
How can we build a democratic civilization, a democratic modernity, which will let flourish the search for freedom, not only of humans, but that of the universe? So this is a very important question for Abdullah Hocalam because uh, it's an individual, I mean, it's a personal question as well for us all, all right? How do we pursue our freedom on the one hand? And it's also a question concerning the universe, given the fact that we are continuously as human beings capturing and exploiting uh, nature. Uh, how can we understand, how can we in, see in nature the search for freedom, which we should respect, which we should be in harmony with rather than respect, which, which, which we should be in harmony with. Uh, so uh, then the first, uh, well, I said overcoming hierarchy and power, uh, and for freedom, I want to say, I want to use the word institutionalization of freedom. Maybe you might think that institutionalization and freedom are two opposite concepts, but they are actually not. Because freedom in Öcalan is never defined as individual freedom, but always as collective. Uh, and uh, freedom can only be achieved by organization, not by itself. It doesn't come, it doesn't, it does, it doesn't come when you follow your desire, let's say. Uh, free, in that sense, freedom is not a no to society. Uh, as liberals would argue, uh, and it's, it's not a yes to individual desire, but the building of collective desires and thereby increasing and democratizing the capacity of people for meaning making. And we need to create institutions in order for our search for freedom to be sustainable. We need to create practices, we need to create norms, we need to create laws, I mean, not laws, norms, I should say, uh, in order for uh, our search for freedom, uh, in order to make our search for freedom to be sustainable, rather than captured by state, by forms like state, capital, or man. Now, power in Öcalan has two very important characteristics, or I want to focus on two uh, characteristics that I see very important. One of them is power can never be conceptualized without conceptualizing force. Power is always related to force. It's always related to violence, whether we recognize it or not. We might have internalized certain values and not uh, in that sense challenge power and therefore not maybe encounter violence. But the moment we challenge power, we challenge the status quo, we challenge hierarchy, we will always be forced to do things we don't want to do. And the, uh, so if force, force is one, and the second is of course law, because law uh, in a sense, um, uh, creates a hierarchy in terms of imagination. What can we imagine as possible? What can we imagine as possible and what is outlawed automa automatically in terms of our imagination, in terms of our practice, practices, in terms of our capacity of meaning making and so on. So one is it's always related to force and law. And second, it always, and that he borrows from Marx, although he will extend the meaning of this, not only in the economic sense, but in the cultural sense as well. Second, it always involves the confiscation of surplus value that, uh, from what others produce. So what we produce as women, let's say, will be captured by men, uh, confiscated by man, what society produces will be captured by state. And what workers produce is captured by, um, by, um, by the bourgeoisie. So uh, in that sense, 
uh, although people will say, and they are right, Öcalan is very much influenced by Foucault and Foucault's definition of power, he sees the insidious ways in which power operates. He sees the importance of uh, the relationship between power and knowledge, but different from Foucault, for Öcalan power resides somewhere. It resides in men, it resides in the state, it resides in capital. So we know in a sense who our enemies are because the moment we challenge these entities, we will be encountering uh, force and violence. So, um, and one uh, thing I should add, again, different from Marx, Marx this is not new. It has been there. I mean, this uh, process in which men confiscate from women um, the means of production, the means of self-defense, the means of governance and state confiscated from society and uh, capital confiscated from, uh, from workers. This has been there for 5,000 years. Uh, since, this, uh, since the emergence of the Sumerian priest states, we have seen the same kind of hierarchies, the same kind of techniques, the same kind of tools uh, uh, power uses and similar uh, 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 ideologies might change, but there is all, uh, always this thing uh, stable. Um, so this is not new, but what happens today is power has become much more encompassing, effective, advanced, comprehensive, more targeted and insidious, sinister. In the sense, when we say no to power, we think we say no to power, sometimes we actually say yes. For example, when we are uh, saying, pursuing our individual freedom, let's say, individual desires, let's say, Actually, we are saying yes to power because that's what the state wants, right? That individual uh, individual rights, not collective rights, individual freedoms realized through the market. That's what, what, what is wanted. So uh, power has become even more insidious. All right, think about, I will, I will give actually, as I go along with these ideas, I will try to give you examples. One of the examples that I like most, actually, Öcalan doesn't give this example, but more and more this example uh, is given by other uh, scholars, other thinkers. Think about the operation of internet. How our labor, I mean, what we do, everything we do in the internet, all kinds of labor we do in the internet becomes data that is sold and used for our governments. So we enjoy internet, but actually, and we labor on internet, we labor on our computers, but what happens is these will be transformed into data and data will be used to govern us, to market goods uh, to us. Um, so um, yeah, uh, it, it, th that's a great example, I think, to understand how uh, if we are not organized, if we are not conscious, conscious about our freedoms, about our search for freedom, if we don't collectivize it, how our individual pursue, pursuits for freedom can be also captured by power, kept confiscated, the, the things we produce confiscated by uh, entities that use it against us. Okay, maybe a note on methodology here. Uh, I think uh, one uh, needs to, uh, if you read the book, one of the, I think, most beautiful passages is about uh, Öcalan's, uh, this famous saying that he has, uh, uh, you can see the whole history in one individual or one event. Well, what does it mean? It means, when we look ourselves, when lo we look at others, we see all these uh, dimensions operating at the same time. Accumulation, exploitation, ideological manipulation, internalization, but also in that very 
uh, in that very event or in that very individual, we can see the search for freedom. And this is what history is all about, this dialectic between people searching freedom against power on the one hand and power becoming more and more insidious, more and more capturing, more conf confiscating. So this, it's this dialectic uh, that we can see in each individual and in each event, and therefore we can see the whole history. Now, in Öcalan's understanding, and I want to dwell on this uh, for a second, ideology plays an enormous role. Well, what does ideology do? Ideology makes certain people and spaces available for ex exploitation. So ideology, um, uh, ideology hierarch, uh, uh, puts hierarchies between people, puts hierarchies, there is the subject, there is the object. Nature is the object, women are the objects, racial minorities are objects, etc. So it divides, ideology divides object and uh, subject and makes objects available for subject exploitation. This is something that Öcalan dwells uh, in this book uh, a long time. And so if ideology in that sense has two fu functions, two, it, it operates in two ways. One, dividing society, Dividing society continuously so that we can not see the whole picture on the one hand. And on the, uh, on the other hand, making things, making people, making spaces available for confiscation, for exploitation. Again, I would like to give an example in that regard. Uh, for example, uh, I, when, when in the 1990s, Kurdish people were forcibly migrated, forcibly displaced from their villagers by the state. What happened? It was not only um, it was not only um, that they lost their land. It was not only that they lost their uh, their homes, but also they were made available for exploitation. First, as cheap labor. Second, as cultural stereotypes, which were then used and exploited in television series, in governance, and so on, as a mat as matter of social policy through poverty assistance programs, through small credits, etc., they were integrated to the market, as I said, as cheap labor, but also as consumers, and these happened differently for women and men. Meanwhile, their land was distributed, redistributed to village guards, uh, those who are loyal to the state, those who are, um, uh, who are paramilitaries of the state, or their land was taken over by the state for mining. So one single case, right, one single event, we can see the whole history playing out in that single event and the different dimensions in which people are made available for COVID. So nationalism, in a sense, made Kurdish villagers available for all kinds of exploitation and abuse. Meanwhile, of course, and that's where freedom comes, these people have become politicized and fought against the state, and they have pursued their rights, transforming urban spaces of Turkey into spaces of urgent insurgency. So they played, uh, they, there, there is always a dialectic relationship and in each event we can see this. So what are the main uh, ideologies that Öcalan uh, discusses? I will, uh, four, four of them I will mention, scientism, religionism, industrialism and nationalism. Why am I talking about these four? Because it's important to see that as concept or as, and as processes, nation, science, religion, industry are not in themselves bad. They can even be 
uh, at times insurgent. For example, when the first religions emerged, they were talking about equality, right? I mean, true uh, people were living in tribes and there were all these hierarchies and these mono monotheistic religions have promised equality to everyone. And for a moment, for a brief moment, they actually enabled some insurgency. The same thing for the nation. People took the streets in the name of nation against feudal lords so or against oligarchies. Um, or the same can be uh, said for science. When in enlightenment science emerged, it was ex actually against religious authorities, against the kinds of power and hierarchy they were uh, executing. So in themselves, they are not bad, but when they become ideologies, unquestionable ideologies, then they are uh, problematic and they need to be deconstructed, untangled and get rid of. Um, so, and in those terms, his most important target is liberalism. Liberal, uh, so freedom in itself, of course, is not, I mean, it's what we are all searching for, it's what we are all yearning for. But on the other hand, when it is appropriated by liberalism, transformed into an ideology for individualized freedom, when society is divided into different spheres, each of them regulated independently, supposedly independently from each other, that means liberalism has become an ideology, and that is where freedom ends and power begins. Okay, um, let me repeat one more uh, again that I uh, uh, this emphasis that Öcalan continuously makes. These are never ever happening without resistance. People are building. I mean, we have uh, as women, as people, as societies, as workers, we have built a tradition of democratic modernity in our search for freedom and in our resistance against capitalist modernity. Well, why does he use words like civilization, modernity? I think I should also maybe um, say a little bit about that. Because when we, for example, uh, today uh, talk about the colonial movements, uh, when we talk about um, uh, uh, local resistance, uh, when we talk about yeah, uh, difference, pluralism, etc., sometimes we, uh, we are, I mean, when scholars talk about this or when uh, fighters, when activists talk about this, sometimes they forget uh, looking at the whole picture. And for Öcalan, um, Öcalan refuses, rejects, detests radical relativism. On the contrary, we are always connected. We are living, the world is humanity's production. And by humanity, I mean all the differences, all the small communities, all the larger communities, all the different entities in the world together produce a human humanities history. There are, of course, no doubt, multiple timelines, different temporalities, different spatialities, multiple identities, but we are living in an interconnected world. We cannot deny this, since what happens in uh, the Amazons will affect us. What happens in Germany will affect the whole world. What happens in Tur Turkey affects the whole world. And we are continuously witnessing that. Um, in the contagiousness of resistances, uh, in the different kinds of diplomacies people are doing with each other. So uh, definitely Öcalan has a holistic perspective of the world, uh, recognizing all the differences and differentiations. He has a holistic uh, perspective of the world, but in his holistic pers perspective, the method of looking at things is how things, uh, how, how, as I said, insurgencies become contagious, how diplomacy between people 
uh, uh, people enable communication, interaction, how exchange connects different uh, in different uh, societies and communities. So no to the universalistic understanding of colonialism or scientism, which homogenize and hegemonize the world. Okay, no to extracting surplus by objectifying parts of the world. But yes to diplomacy, yes to, to uh, contagion, yes to contracts, not laws. Okay, and how, what kind of a world uh, would that be? Where relations are uh, built on contracts, on interactions, on diplomacy, well, that's what it means by democratic confederalism. So different democratic autonomies coming together as democratic confederalism and producing the history of hum humanity. Well, now finally, we come to the question of freedom. Well, what is freedom? What is this um, search for freedom that Öcalan continuously underlines? gives examples from his own search, his, even his search for freedom in his solitary confinement. Uh, he sees in a bird, in a bird song, the search for freedom. He sees in uh, flowers uh, opening towards sky, a search for freedom. He sees in the light, a search for freedom. How can we make this sustainable and not let our freedoms be captured by uh, capitalism, patriarchy, and uh, state systems? That's the crucial question. And in order to uh, uh, give an answer to that question, first we need to define freedom. For Öcalan, freedom means three things, in my opinion. Uh, one of them is movement. Freedom, he says, is energy, light, and energy. What does energy wa want? Energy wants to move and differentiate itself. It becomes different. It never loses, but it will be from kinetic energy to other forms of energies, etc. So it, it repeats itself, but by differentiating, and it is mobile. So for the whole, the whole. Uh, world can be seen in that, in that sense in search uh, for freedom. But what happens? Women are kept at home, middle class is built gated, co gated communities, nature is continuously en enclosed. So what power tries to do is regulate movement. Regulate movement and prison in that sense is the whole, is a metaphor for the whole society, because prison, imprisonment, capturing people's movements, regulating them, preventing from them to preventing them from freely moving, freely imagining, that's what power does. Now, the second um, definition of power is the capacity to make meaning. Well, but Science, re, uh, scientism, religionism, sexism, nationalism, all these ideologies actually are meaning producing, name producing rather, name producing ideologies. They say to people what they are, who they are, how they should live. And they put these questions in brackets and don't let people to collectively re-raise these questions and give different answers, imagine different answers to such questions. Well, Sylvia Winter, maybe some of our audience is familiar with Sylvia Winter. Uh, she's a great Jamaican, um, uh, Jamaican scholar. And I actually see her thought and Ojalan's thoughts are very similar in the sense, I mean, not very similar, but kin to each other. They have a kinship. They are not maybe aware of this kinship, but they have a kinship. Uh, and they, they ask similar questions. 
uh, they are both, they both want to talk about the universe, not singular things. They want to talk about the whole history of mankind and they are searching in the past uh, for, uh, for um, clues, uh, for a, um, other kind of humanity, other kind of the world. And she says this for sexism, religionism, uh, uh, and all that, they are colonizing truth, freedom, and being. And what we need to do is decolonize truth, freedom, and, uh, and uh, being. So only some people are given the capacity to name, and that is what power is, the capacity to name. So we have to be able to collectively raise these questions. How do we define ourselves? How do we define our people? How do we define our communities? How do we define our life? For example, for women, what would women be if they would rescue themselves, if they would liberate? And that's something Ajalan continuously tells women, liberate yourself from the definition of man. Ask to yourself and build new norms for how you want to be, who you want to be, and how you want to live. And this is not an individual endeavor. This is a collective endeavor. This is a collective endeavor because we are collectively named. We are never only singular. We are always, I mean, we are singular, uh, but in, in certain senses, but it, it, what we call individuality does not um, correspond to singularity. Our individual names, women, um, I don't know, um, Turkish, uh, whatever, they are given to us by society. How can we redefine them? How can we give new meanings to these names collectively? as a society, okay? And the final uh, meaning of uh, freedom for Öcalan is the capacity to construct. Construct, well, again, construct, the capacity to construct at the beginning, it seems so obvious, but it's, it's not. It's, I think, a very deep way of thinking about freedom. Uh, because it involves so much imagination. We have to, in order to construct, we have to imagine something first. We have to decolonize our imagination. We have to decolonize our capacity to envision. And then we have to decolonize our actual labor power. What can women build? What can women construct? What can we as a society construct, build our irrigation systems, our uh, whole um, subsistence economy. We actually do have the capacity, but these capacities have been confiscated from us. And state tells us that state serves us. Actually, it robs us from our capacity to construct and to constitute. And again, to imagine. Now, um, and how can we, uh, I'm coming to the end of my talk, um, but some final words. Uh, let me go back to the uh, idea of institutionalization. I talked about democratic confederalism, democratic autonomy, but the most frequent way uh, Abdullah Hocalan talks about how we can institutionalize freedom is through a moral political society. A moral society means a society who has a collective conscious, a co conscious, a collective understanding of truth, a collective answer to the question of who we are and how we want to live. Um, and we cannot leave this to the law, law, because right, we are used to believing that um, laws tell us who we are, laws tell us how we should live. But no, laws begin where morality ends. Laws begin where freedom ends, because laws mean 
now that these answers are have been crystallized in favor of power and we cannot once again ask those questions collectively together and give new answers so <clears throat> moral society is definitely uh, means that values are not coded in in law laws which give power to state but the ability to ask again 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 and again the question of who we are and how we should be live and how what is the method for asking this this question democratic politics without democratic politics there is no society and again instead the moment democratic politics and the state begins because the state takes over uh, the capacity to make decisions, the capacity to govern, but we want to take them back if we want to be free. Um, and moreover, democratically distribute. So no professionalization as well, right? I mean, maybe division of labor, but changing forms of division of labor, because we all want as a collectivity, we all want the same kinds of uh, access to uh, different means of production, different means of self-defense. We want these means to be democratized uh, and democratically uh, uh, distributed. Uh, I think I will end here um, if that's all right. And I would maybe uh, continue with the questions that are uh, raised. All right, thanks a lot, Nazan. That was really helpful. Um, there are some questions um, that were posed on um, YouTube. So I will tell you them like step by step and you can maybe answer and we can also see whether more are coming. Um, the first question, question I would tell you is um, that somebody is asking whether you could elaborate on how science as ideology so as scientism is problematic, like what do you mean by that? Okay, uh, many different, in, uh, one of them I already said, science uh, it, it differentiates between object and subject, who knows and who is known. And we know that all social sciences uh, in one way or another uh, by making this division between object and subject uh, have uh, contributed to colonialism. But we are now discovering, of course, also that this differentiation between object and subject not only caused the colonization of people, but also it's caused the colonization of nature through physical sciences. So that's one way in which the ideology of scientism works continuously objectifying certain things and making them available for exploitation, intervention, and, uh, and um, experiment. That's one thing. But the second way in which scientism works is by uh, devaluing all other kinds of knowledge, right? I mean, we are giving this uh, as the women's movement, uh, we are giving this example very frequently. Actually, medicine is, uh, medicine is built on experience, right? They, you give a, a medication, if it works, it works you make experiments, etc. Women have been doing this for years through their plants, through different kinds of care, but science has de devalued women's knowledge and turned science into a male profession. So that is also scientism, devaluing all kinds of knowledge that are not produced in the institutions of science. I hope this answer was uh, satisfactory. I also hope so. Um, there were some more questions. Um, and 
one person is also asking you whether you could explain the difference between capitalist and democratic modernity. This is like a lot, like big question. You can see how much you can elaborate it. <laughs> okay, capitalist modernity and democratic modernity is, uh, yeah, it's a very uh, difficult question. Uh, uh, John has written uh, volumes uh, to answer that question. Uh, but what I can say is capitalist modernity is this, uh, the, uh, its building blocks are state, capitalism, and patriarchy. It is the society we are living in. It's the, uh, it's the history of men confiscating from women, state confiscating from workers, um, um, uh, capital confiscating from workers, men confiscating uh, from women, state confiscating from society, the means of production, the means of self-governance, and the means of self-defense. That history is the history of capitalist modernity. But on the other hand, people have always resisted, resisted this. Communities have resisted state, uh, women have resisted men. They have a, a, a history of resisting and experimenting with other forms of life. And that's the history of democratic modernity. But our goal or Öcalan proposes that uh, means for uh, transforming our contemporary way of life into democratic modernity. So, and creating a democratic civilization where uh, means of governance, means of self-defense and means of production are equally and democratically distributed through assemblies, through academies, and of course, means of knowing, through assemblies, through academies, through cooperatives, Etc. So uh, I hope in this brief time, that's how I would explain the difference between capitalist modernity and democratic modernity. Thank you also for that. Um, there are many questions now. <laughs> oh my God. I will <laughs> I will not take them like chronologically. I think um, I will try to have some red line also in the plot of the discussion. So um, I think we might continue with um, the question whether you could articulate the four dimensions of science, scientism, religion, fundamentalism, nation, nationalism, industry, industri industrialism and um, the forms of the dispos dispossession they imply a bit more, um, someone Laura is asking. Well, I tried my best to do it, but I can repeat myself maybe. Uh, I mean, the difference between these entities and then the ideology itself is act to me very clear. Nation cannot be bad in itself. It's not bad. I mean, a democratic, we can envision a democratic nation where all the people who live together have a contract uh, and established um, norms uh, 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 in which terms they come together uh, and they can act as a society, as a democratic society with assemblies, etc. And that can be a democratic nation. There is no problem with that. But nationalism comes into play when certain people see themselves or, or when projects of homogenization and hegemonization play themselves out. So certain way of being, certain way of looking, certain way of speaking become the norm as against all others on the one hand. And everybody is uh, forced to be like that norm. That's nationalism. That's how ideology works. The nation, when it emerged, remember, the nation emerged uh, from within uh, capitalism as, uh, as a promise of equality 
for all citizens, as opposed to the feudal system where only certain citizens had rights. But Nash nation uh, promised that, but what happened? Well, it puts it uh, uh, tried to homogenize people. It put economic inequality in parentheses and didn't care about that. So actually this promise was never realized because of nationalism. So nation and nationalism are not at all in congruence with, with each other, but in opposition almost. The same can be said for science and scientism. There is nothing bad in terms of, you know, uh, in terms of producing knowledge. But when you devalue all other forms of knowledge and enforce the knowledge that you have on all other people and moreover divide people or divide nature and uh, uh, humans as those about which knowledge should pr produce and as knowledge producers, that's a problem. That's a problem. So the same goes for uh, religion, uh, for industrialism. Well, I'm not sure whether industry in itself is necessarily um, something to celebrate, but industry, if we are going to develop, if we are going to talk about industry as uh, processing certain, transforming things into other things, right? But when industrialism becomes an ideology, okay, when you see industry or industrialism and progress become equated, that's when this problem starts. Thanks a lot. Um, Another question would be why, um, on your opinion, laws by de definition mean a state to you? And what do you think if people democratically and ethically pass laws for their own community, whether, they, whether you see a difference there? Well, if those, laws, if, if those laws are about how to live together in the sense of, you know, in the sense of being a, a contract, contract. I don't see it as problematic. But when laws replace debate, when laws de uh, uh, replace decision making processes, I think that's a huge problem. And that's the kind of society we are living in. Right? I mean, capitalist modernity is exactly that. Laws have replaced morality, moral questioning, uh, moral, uh, ethical questioning, maybe moral will, um, in, it doesn't translate right uh, in English. Ethical questioning, uh, it puts laws, put certain things uh, in brackets and gives certain people the, the uh, right to punish others, the right to dictate how others live. Whenever and we make an insurgency in Germany too, and all over the world, we are uh, overwatched, we are, um, uh, we are uh, banned, we are uh, oversighted by the police, right? I mean, because laws tell you what you can want, what you cannot want, what you can imagine, what you cannot imagine, what kind of life is pursuable, what kind of life is not pursuable. But our goal is actually putting these questions out of brackets and debating them democratically among ourselves as politically empowered individuals and communities. Yes, that's my answer. Okay. And if you need maybe one more, uh, uh, one more um, uh, thing I can add, I mean, Walter Benjamin, one of the greatest thinkers of our times. Uh, and I think uh, in a sense, uh, Öcalan also implicitly is in dialogue with Benjamin, whether he read it or not, I don't know, but Benjamin has influenced, of course, Foucault, Agamben, and those writers Öcalan has read. For him, law is, uh, 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 sorry, violence and law are akin to each other. Violence is either lawmaking or law sustaining. 
whenever, I mean, why do we call certain people terrorists? Why is this, I mean, why are certain actions defined as terrorism? Uh, because we don't want, I mean, the laws somehow categorize those wishes as unimaginable, inhumane, right? And by calling, by calling them terrorists and nothing else, no, not criminal, not other words, but terrorists, it takes to itself the leeway of doing whatever they want to do with them, right? Bombing places. Uh, putting play people in prison without interrogation. That's what law does. That's what state law does. Yeah. Then, then somebody is also asking um, what your personal opinion is on Erjalan's philosophy of free life. I don't know how also how broad you only like right now want to um, talk about that, but maybe you can yeah give a highlight on how you perceive the idea of free life, what you understand by it, and maybe your view on it. Well, my personal a view of free life is very much inspired by Öcalan, definitely. And I see by free life the cap uh, these three things. Uh, as I've said, the capacity to make meaning, the capacity to constitute, to imagine, to imagine, uh, and uh, the, the capacity to move, to become something else than what we are. Uh, I mean, to, uh, to know what, who we are and what we are, but also to become someone else, to become something else, the, the movement, the differentiation. Uh, I see those things as free life. Um, and definitely, I have never found a way to do these things without a collectivity. So I feel that I am free with a collectivity, because with collectivities do I um uh, gain these capacities to name to imagine and to move to be some something else to differentiate myself to uh, be i mean ojalan says one plus one is two right but that doesn't mean it's a repetition it means now there is a difference and i think becoming two is free life or three or four. The questions are very difficult, but <laughs> very, very, very comprehensive. Um, and I, uh, 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 yeah, I find it hard to, um, uh, uh, of course, it's difficult with Zoom because I don't see any people and I don't know if my answers are satisfactory or are you going like, Boo, what kind of an answer is that? I have no idea. Um, so I'm hoping that um, I'm not alienating people with my answers. Besides listening to you, we are also seeing at the chat on YouTube. So um, we can also, also have a look later on it and uh, see how reactions have been. But I think you don't need to worry about <laughs> your answers um, at all. I think that's completely fine. <laughs> okay. Um, and somebody is also asking whether you can elaborate on women forming their own freedom outside of the patriarchal culture and society. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I mean, definitely autonomous structures, autonomous organization, that's uh, for women uh, the most required, uh, I mean, the most important way of becoming free. Uh, I uh, value autonomous, I mean, I can give you an example. Uh, let, let me not be abstract. I give you an example. We have uh, uh, created uh, in, uh, I don't know, a couple of years ago, the woman television, Jin TV, and I work there and I go there and everybody's women, everybody, all the people who are working behind, who are working on the scene, 
who are doing the regi, who are doing the montage, who are building stuff, uh, building the studio. We are all women and we are an autonomous uh, or uh, woman, woman's television. And in there, that autonomy gives us first the capacity to construct. I mean, I never thought in my whole life that I would be capable of doing montage. But now, I mean, I am an academic, uh, but I hate professionalism, uh, pro uh, pro professionalization, sorry, professionalization. And I love the fact that I can now do montage. I can uh, stay behind the camera. Uh, I can do uh, small documentaries. I learned many, many things. And all the women there have learned many, many things. Uh, we have the capacity to name ourselves because we decide what, what we should show, you know, what kind of femininity, what kind of womanhood, what kind of Mater, mater, um, maternality, what kind of um, right womanhood? We define womanhood. We uh, define it together with the, with our audiences, uh, without, of course, patriarchy influence us. But then we show each other. Oh, look, this is patriarchal. This is patriarchal. We shouldn't have shown this like that, and. We are imagining every day we come up our uh, crew and we come up with new programs, new ways of showing women, new ways of thinking about uh, women's freedom. That's, I think, how, I mean, that's what I understand from women's uh, freedom. Uh, it's not, uh, again, I don't feel free by pursuing my own singular desire. Uh, but when my desire becomes in tune with all other women and uh, is, uh, it moves, moves towards other women to, and together with other women. Uh, so women's autonomy, definitely, women's dialogue among themselves, women's diplomacy, all of these things are necessary for women's freedom. All right. Um, and then there is the question, um, what are the institutions of freedom that we must create and um, whether you, th you think that they must be hierarchical or federalist, federalist ones? Did you understand the question? Yeah, of course, federalist ones. And I think uh, I, I gave, I mean, three institutions, for example, it can be multiplied that comes to mind based on the Rojava experiences, assemblies, academies, and cooperatives. All these are horizontal uh, organizations. Assemblies are where people come together to make decisions. There are neighborhood assemblies, <clears throat> town assemblies, canton assemblies, uh, uh, city assemblies, etc. And the co same thing for cooperatives and the same thing for academies. Uh, academies are learning centers where people's knowledge is validated as, as knowledge, right? Because people have su suffered for such a long time for uh, not being, um, for not having their knowledge considered as knowledge. I mean, we call certain people unskilled labor. What a, what a horrible, horrible name that is. I mean, these people are extremely skilled actually they are, you know, uh, they know a lot about past, about future. They know um, about children. They know about their neighborhood. They know about, about their plants. And we call them unskilled labor. And anyway, this is parenthesis. This was parenthesis. Uh, so uh, uh, academies are places where uh, people's knowledge are validated and revalidated, and mo moreover, people are uh, invited to be members. Uh, I mean, taught, invited, uh, educated to be members of a democratic society. Uh, and cooperatives are economic units where everybody participates equally. 
uh, and where there is collective uh, property ship, collective labor, and collective marketing. Uh, and there can be many different models, many different uh, systems, many different institutions, as long as certain principles like the democratization of all those means, means of production, means of uh, self-defense and means of governance and means of knowing yourself, all those are democratic. I mean, there, we can imagine other institutions too, I'm sure. Okay. And then one of the last questions until now, at least, um, whether you can talk a bit about the relation between state and democracy that Ajalan sees. State and democracy are two opposite things. Uh, where there is state, there is no democracy. Where there is no, I mean, they are oppositional forces. The same with society and state. The more there, so state there is, the less society there is. I mean, democracy is remembered, but how we define, I mean, what democracy is. Like right now, what are the decisions that we are making in so-called democratic nations besides, besides electing those people who will rule over us? We cannot make most of the economic decisions we cannot make. There are laws and rules that uh, that uh, determine our economic life. You are going to work from eight to five. You are going to, you know, get an income in return. You are not uh, you are not owner of what you produce, but you are an a, a employed person. I mean, all these things are basically regulated by this by states' laws. We cannot question them, we cannot change them, we cannot transform them. Best we can do is choose the people who will follow those laws, who will enforce those laws on us. And our uh, imagination is so uh, tight, so small, that our imagination, we, we don't imagine about other ways of being, other societies, other sociabilities, but about choices between different political parties. Democracy is the opposite of that. Democracy is being able to, to uh, imagine other ways of being, imagine new sociabilities and making decisions about whether you wanna pursue it or not. Collectively talking, collectively discussing, making new possibilities through collective action. And that is what state prevents us from doing. If you allow me, before you ask the next question, I will turn on the light. It became a little bit dark here. That looks good. <laughs> Was a good idea. So, um, like, I think one point that might be um, good and nice to highlight is that in the beginning, you were also saying that um, Ajalan is um, yeah, also taking liberalism as a main target and is highlighting the meaning of liberalism. Um, and also when we see like the realities in Europe, that's also a really important topic to talk about. Can you maybe um, talk a bit more about why that is? I, I'm not sure I get it. Why? What is? Like why he is taking such a focus on liberalism and to analyze liberalism. Yes, because liberalism is one of the, uh, I mean, this has a long history. Again, how do you define liberalism, etc. But liberalism, if we are going to talk about individual freedom and freedom mostly, uh, this individual freedom in liberal societies are realized through market and through law. Both of them are actually enslaving uh, entities. Uh, liberalism is about individual freedom. It is about, uh, about uh, 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 dividing society into different spheres like how can liberalism answer 
questions about equality, questions about the distribution of means of production, distribution of property. Liberalism cannot answer these things because for it, uh, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't uh, interfere with the market and with, with economic inequalities. On the other hand, it doesn't recognize, recognize collective rights. It only recognizes individual rights, and by recognizing on individual rights, it also divides society into, into these into uh, these uniform individual beings who pursue their own individual freedoms without uh, a co without collective action, and therefore liberalism is the target of Erdogan. Because when we when we look at when he looks at Europe. He doesn't see freedom. I mean, there is nothing, no freedom, I mean, in my opinion as well, there is no freedom in Europe because Europe is ruled by law, mostly. And imagination is imprisoned. And how can we uh, free imagination? How can we free, uh, 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 yeah. How can we free imagination? How can we, I mean, there is this, you know, like progress and being better and being, you know, uh, your whole day is, uh, 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 your whole temporality, your whole timeline, your whole spatial movement are regulated. There is no space for creativity and for, I'm, I don't mean artists, uh, art only by creativity. I mean, imagining other ways of being and becoming. which is to me what art is, by the way. True words. Um, somebody else is also um, saying that in this soci sociology of freedom, Artelan says, quote, the political and moral fabric of society has been smashed, leading to a social phenomenon that even goes beyond genocide, society side. Could you elaborate on what society side is? Society side is killing the capacity of society to, to rule itself, to produce morality and democracy. Look, I mean, I have, I think we have all seen society side, the effects of society side during the pandemic. I mean, imagine what would happen if the markets would be closed? We would all die of hunger, right? I mean, we are incapable of collectively raising anything, especially in Europe. We would be all, we would all die because we are on, dependent on our markets. We are dependent on the state for doing the vaccination. We are depending on, we cannot as a society generate values, generate ways of taking care of ourselves, generate ways of yeah, taking care of ourselves and of each other. We cannot do that. We are completely dependent on other, on market, on state, and that's society side. Society died. Society cannot produce collectively, cannot govern itself, cannot provide for its needs and cannot take care of each other. But of course, there is also ways of dialectic. What we do, do, we do, we do try to invent ways of taking care of ourselves, even you know, under those conditions. But our imaginations were of course restricted and our capacities and capabilities too, but we tried, right? By volunteering, for example, to bring goods to the play to the uh, houses where all people lived and so on and so forth we did certain things we are still searching for freedom it's not hopeless but in a sense society side ha happened and is continuing to happen we are not i mean we are going to imagine in two generations the world is going to become a hell and we are giving birth to new children, knowing this, and as societies, we are incapable of stopping it. What is this if not society side? Okay. 
So to maybe draw like a, a better end than talking about society side in the end of a panel. <laughs> um, and I think that's also a really important um, yeah, topic to talk about and also to think about how to build society again. And also to see that, to see that like hope is everywhere and it's always there, but we have to see it and to take it as like as real and as a reason to act and to move towards a better world. Um, and that is also leading to, I would say, my closing question. Um, that would be um, how, on your opinion, um, like steps could be made uh, could be made to build an ethic and moral moral like um, like ethic political society again without laws um, in a state sense, for example, or like without the state mentality. Organization, 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 organization. That's all I can say. I mean, we have to come together, think together. Uh, we have to decide together. Uh, and we have to do this. Uh, we have to do this in contact with each other. That is, I mean, if I'm doing it here in Mexico, somebody else is doing it in Rojava, somebody else is doing it. We have to be in contact. We have to exchange with each other. We have to create from within this society, a new society, a new society with new imaginations. I mean, I don't think there is any other way of being in this world. You, we, we need to be able to imagine what would a, a, a happy, <laughs> a happy, a free community would look like and we, we should realize it now, here and now, without any fear, without any fear and with great loyalty. I think loyalty to ideas, loyalty to imaginations are very important. We cannot be distracted. We cannot, uh, yeah. I'm, uh, I mean, I don't know if this was satisfactory to your question, but uh, was it or? I mean, to find a real satisfying answer, we have to be on a path together, no? Like we cannot bring the perfect answer tonight. So I think exactly. I didn't, or I think nobody expected like a all over holistic answer, how we can do and what we do tomorrow and what we do in one year. That was not the aim of the question. Yeah, okay, great. <laughs> so great. I'm very happy about your answer. Okay. Um, and I may ask you now whether there is anything you want to add um, and yeah, whether no, you want- like to thank you for a great conversation. Thank you very much. I think we have to thank you a lot. And um, yeah, give a big greeting back to you and hope to see you again. And also um, thanks a lot to all the visitors and um, like uh, the people who post questions. And yes, thanks a lot and see you.